everyone. This is Judy Warner with the Altium On Track podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Today we have another incredible uh, subject matter expert that you'll be familiar with because we've had him here before, which is Chris Hunrath from Inselectro. And we're going to talk about flex and material sets and all kinds of really great things. So hang tight for that. Um, Before we get going, please, I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. I share a lot of things there for designers and engineers. And on Twitter, I'm at Altium Judy, and Altium is on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Today, Chris has some show and tell, and so I encourage you, if you, Chris will take time to describe what he's showing, but if you want to see it, feel free to go to our YouTube channel at Altium, click under videos, and you'll see all our podcasts there, and you can click on this podcast, and then you'll be able to visually see the materials and things that Chris is referring to today. And that's always available, by the way, on YouTube. So we record simultaneously in video and in audio. So just know that's always a opportunity there for you. So Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for joining again. So um, at the end of last time's podcast, we were talking about the rise in flex applications and sort of, um, the increasing uh, amount of business actually in Selectra is doing around flex materials, new materials are going out. So I really wanted to take this opportunity to learn about what is driving this uptick in flex, what applications are driving it, you know, what the, the cost performance implications of that is. And so let's just start with what is driving this uptick in flex? So a lot of it's medical, uh, you know, uh, and the way uh, uh, electronics are finding, you know, their way into medical applications. Um, actually, it's everything. It's automotive. It's it's aerospace. It's uh, military. It's uh, military has always been a big user of flex. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, all the new inventions that are used in medical applications. Um, certainly, some devices are implantable, and that's something that's not new. Um, but then we're seeing a lot, a lot of applications where instruments are being created that are used, you know, for surgeries and things, mm. uh, and they use flex circuits, and that's because you can make things very small, which is always an advantage, yeah. you know, when it comes to those applications. Um, and we're even some, we're even seeing some applications where the products are reused, they're being sterilized, autoclave, what have you, and then they're uh, they're being reused, but. Lots of new techniques, lots of new devices being developed uh, using Flex. You know, most people are familiar with with traditional Flex applications, like your laptop screen. You know, very often the interconnect right. between the the main you know the main system and the the screen is a Flex circuit. You know, the old uh, the old flip phones. You know, all had Flex yeah. circuits. Um, you know, your uh, your inkjet printers, you know, had a dynamic flex uh, right. uh, circuit, you know, between the between the print head and the actual, uh, you know, motherboard and, mm-hmm. and the printer. Um, and actually, that's something I do want to point out is, you know, we describe flex applications in two main buckets. One is dynamic flex and the other is the flex, flex to install. And it's, it's, it's just exactly what it sounds like is flex to install. Typically, you're only bending the circuit once or twice to fit it in whatever it needs to go into, and then that's mm-hmm. it. Right? right. Whereas uh, dynamic flex, you know, the, the the parts flexed in use, you know, many, many, many times. Right. Um, I think that something that most people can relate to because you can see it is the flex inside copy machines, right? You can see right. that dynamic flex moving and again and again. And so are the materials or the entire circuit rated to have X amount of dynamic motions, you know, for the life of it, or how does that work? Yeah, actually, that's a very good point, and that, that could become very complex. A lot of it has to do with layer count, the base material, you know, the most popular uh, base material for flex circuits in uh, reflow assembled PCB, a little different okay. than printed electronics applications, we're using conductive adhesive, but if you're doing reflow assembly, the most common material is polyimide film, and one, right. of the most com- one of the most common materials is Kapton. Right. Um, but the thickness of the materials, the, the type of copper circuitry, the thickness of the copper foil, 
all those all those play into a uh, number of bend cycles mm-hmm. even the type of copper um, the, you know whether you use rolled and yield which is very common in flex versus uh, electro deposited okay um, oil so uh, but that that can get very complex there are some good design guidelines out there by IPC and others you know again I always shout out to the board shops uh, some of them are you know they have got good teams that they help do. people uh, you know, choose the right construction, the right stack up to get the most out of the uh, the most bend cycles out of the uh, out of the device. Are those the two most common types of copper used in flex? By the way, Chris, is a rolled anneal and electroless. Oh, it's electro deposited. I'm and sorry, yes. electro deposited. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, and and yes, but but uh, unless you're dealing with very thin foils, uh, rolled anneal is the most common. Okay. Or what we call RA foil is the most common. Right. Actually, I have, a, I have a sample here. This okay. is some uh, Pyrolux clad. You can't see the dielectric inside, but it's got rolled and yield copper on both sides. And it can, it, can, it can vary from, used to be limited to half ounce or uh, 18 micron and thicker. Mm-hmm. So a little side note on foils, uh, as you go uh, thicker, it's harder to make electrodepositive foils because it's more, more plating time on the drum. Uh, with rolled and yield, it's the opposite. Thinner foils are harder to manufacture because you need more rolling processes to make the foil thinner and thinner and thinner. I see. Used, used to be limited to 18 micron or, or half ounce. Uh, now we can get rolled and yield coppers thinner, you know, down to nine micron uh, or quarter ounce. Um, you can mm. get a rolled and yield. But okay. it's rolled and yield, the structure is much better for flexing because the, uh, the grain boundaries are are uh, in this direction platelet type overlapping grain boundaries which is okay. better for bending okay you need foil the grain boundaries are like this and if you bend it you can cleave the grain boundaries and you get more bent it's not that ed foil doesn't work in flex but you typically get more bend cycles out of rolled and yield okay very good i that's something actually i didn't know and and it is something I've, you know i've talked to my friend tara down who's in flex and it's just something that's never come up so i think that's kind of an interesting Point. So you you mentioned with military applications because my background in military was always swap right size weight and power right. So are those the same type of things that drive the other applications? Obviously, you know smaller spaces we can fold things upon themselves and get them into smaller packaging. Right. Then you talk about the dynamic. What other kind of things sort of drive the the desire and the the fit for for flex. So something that's applicable to both military and medical is uh, you want you want to reduce the size. So I have here, a, this is a uh, 50 ohm SMA coax, right? It's basically one circuit, right? You've got the shield layer, you know, the shielding um, around the uh, around the center conductor, but this is one channel or one circuit. And I have here a flex, and you can see how many <laughs> how many circuits uh-huh. you have on this piece. Uh-huh. So imagine if you had to have one of these for each one of these. For each channel, right. Now, now if you, depending on the on the design, whether it's strip line, micro strip, um, and whether or not you have, uh, you know, in-plane uh, 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 shielding, uh, it might be every other one's a signal, but still the weight and size is the difference between having cables, right, which I, you know, what's what I'm holding up right now versus right. having a flex circuit is huge. Right. And in the case of me, uh, medical, some of those traces could be as narrow as 20 micron. So mm. you could fit a lot of circuitry in a very small space. And you know, depending on the on the medical device, um, you know, we see some some of our customers will build circuits that are very very long and very very narrow. And you can imagine, you know, how they're used in in surgery and other medical applications. And you might have, you know, 20, you know, circuits on that part, but it's in a very, very, very small space. Right. Uh, that totally 20, makes sense. Now, just, just to be clear, 20 micron circuitry is not easy to do. It's doable, not easy to do. Right. Uh, but certainly 50 microns is, most board shops can do that uh, mm-hmm. these days. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you know, again, you can fit a lot of circuits in a small space. And, mm-hmm. of course, they can, they can flex, they can bend. But in the case of rigid flex, right, where you have a rigid part and, um, you know, bridged with a, uh, a flex part. And here's another example, you know, where you'd have, you know, uh, this is not necessarily rigid flex, but you would have components here and then a connector here. You're replacing all these cables, right? Right. With this, se- with this section. So that's how, right. that's how it drives weight and space and even reliability. Fewer, fewer interconnections, 
uh, tend to be more reliable. So that really, right. you know, really helps. Um, so the flex has been, you know, growing quite a bit for us, you know, for our business. And so, uh, you know, a lot of it's based on DuPont Capton uh, and DuPont Pyrolex products. Um, and that they, there's a, a B stage system for laminating the different layers. And of course the core or the clad material has the foil on both sides. And then our customers will print etch to whatever pattern they need and put those layers together as building blocks. Right. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about design for flex since most folks listening here will be engineers or layout folks. What are some things that people need to keep in mind um, about designing these kind of circuits that's sort of unique to flex? So um, there's a couple of good, again, some good guides out there, both by IPC. Uh, DuPont has a flex, uh, flex uh, uh, manuals for different types of uh, categories, whether it's multi-layer, single-sided, double-sided flex, they have some, some good guidelines on that. But in general, what you want to avoid is you don't want circuits to, uh, to make turns or bends in the uh, bend area. So, for example, I'm going to use this one as an example again. Okay. If this is the if this is the flex area in this middle section here, yes, you wouldn't have the circuits uh, go in different directions in that area. So you right. want to keep them you want to keep them uh, you know uh, basically parallel in that area, uh, and you also don't want plated through holes in those areas. Um, again, these are just real general rule basic guidelines. The other thing you want to avoid is what we call an I beam effect where you have circuits directly uh, above each other with the dielectric in between, you want to stagger them. That helps, again, more important for dynamic flex than, than bend to install, uh -huh. but it's important not to have the I-beam effect because that could lead to circuit cracks. That makes uh, sense. Concentrates the bending. And in general, from a stack up standpoint, you want, you want to try and balance the construction. Uh, thinner is typically better. Uh, there's, Again, there's all kinds of iterations. There's, there's uh, if it's a multi-layer flex, there's loose, loose leaf constructions where you wouldn't necessarily bond the different layers together in the flex or bend region. You'd have them, uh, um, you know, not connected. Uh, Bookbinder uh, system is another way to do it, where depending on the direction of bend, the um, the layers that are on the outside of the bend are actually longer than the, yes. the layers on the inside, and Again, uh, the fabricators that are skilled in that know how to how to space that and to uh, change the length of the circuit. And uh, but you know, from a simpler standpoint uh, or from a more general standpoint, you know, thinner is typically better. Uh, balanced um, balanced constructions are are typically better. You know, for for flex. Uh, well, balanced construction is always a good idea. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. Even you know, um, even rigid. Yeah. Yeah, but. I could see that, right? Because I think you, what you're saying, if I'm if I'm hearing you right, is you have to to look for those opportunities for cracking, right, or stressing, um, right, at right. the bend it's, radius because that makes sense, right? Just physic in from a physics standpoint, it makes sense that things would want to give or pull, right? In right. That. When you, when you bend a flex circuit. You're stretching the outside and compressing the inside, right? And every circuit will fail at some point. It's a matter of how many cycles you get out of it before it fails. Right. How do you um, measure those cycles, by the way? Well, there are some there are some standardized tests. You uh -huh. know, there's an MIT bend test. There's some other testing that's done to to um, uh, you know to see how a, a particular material or even a design or a stack up uh, performs uh, where it's bended. It's bent. I'm sorry. Uh, repeatedly, and until you get failure, and then you can you can rate the uh, the stack up or the or and or the material. Uh, but where it's can important. you where can you get that data? You mentioned IPC as a source. Is there any other um, thing resources you could share that I could share with the listeners where they could kind of well, uh, maybe actually, look at some of these readings or. Yeah, actually, so Dupont's website, you know, the Pyrolux uh, website has some some data okay. on that. Uh, and certainly some of the folks there could, uh, you know, put your, uh, your okay. listeners in, in touch with, uh, with some of the design guidelines. Okay. Um, All right. I know some folks there. If, if we, if you and I can't find them through the website, then, um, 
uh, Jonathan just came in to talk at IPC Designers Council in Orange County. I'll reach out to him, see if Oh, Jonathan can... Weldon, yeah. Uh -huh. he's, yeah. He's a great resource for that. So speaking of Jonathan Weldon, he's been working with HD Pug. Uh, they've been looking at uh, uh, shield layers or, uh, or reference planes, and they've been looking at the difference between solid planes and, um, and crosshatch systems. And so this is a, just a simple, this is actually a simple test circuit. Uh, microstrip construction where you have a, uh, a reference plane on one side and your trace you know, on the other. Imagine if there were this sort of strip line construction and you had copper on both sides um, with your uh, transmission line in the middle. Um, one of the challenges with all PCBs and especially with flex is absorption of moisture and then that moisture release during assembly causing delamination. And one of the things that uh, you can do to mitigate that is to bake the parts. Well, if you have soft, uh, solid copper areas, baking does not work as well because the moisture has got to go around the copper. It can't go through it. Right. So uh, crosshatch ground planes are great for two purposes. One is it's a, it's a moisture egress for baking. The other advantage is, is it's actually better for flexibility. It makes the part more flexible. Hmm, that makes the sense. Down, the downside is, is the high frequency applications uh, you can run into some <laughs> you can run into some issues. So, yeah. So uh, and one of the interesting things that uh, that Jonathan and, and company they were looking at was the difference between a round opening and a uh, what's typically used is it's, it's kind I'm of a diamond call, shape. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And uh -huh. really, it's more of a, a you know a square turned on its side. But but right. yeah, the diamond shape versus the uh, you know and it's funny how how circuit design is always in orthogonal patterns. Uh, but uh, that's not necessarily the best way to go. And anyway, the round shape was better uh, for signal performance. Oh, and it's, for the high-speed applications? Yeah, it, it makes mm. sense because if you took a circle that fit inside a square, you actually have less open area. So Yeah, this is true. Uh, okay, yeah, so, all right. Yeah, so there's some interesting data on that. Uh, but I, I would recommend to a customer, depending on their, their, uh, you know, their frequency bandwidth, uh, bit rate, depending on what kind of design it is, um, that they would look at using a, a, an open plane, you know, or basically with a screen, for lack of better words, versus a solid plane, because the reliability goes way up. Okay, uh, now you just made me think of something. Last time we talked, we were talking about pre-pregs and glass, you know, being reinforced, right? When you're using adhesive systems for flex, I'm Assuming they're non-reinforced, right? It's a more stable material, though. So I tell us a little bit about that, about yeah. sort of the stability, the dimensional stability, and yeah. So, so really, in flex circuits, the capped-on film, the polyimide film, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a thermal set, uh, it is acting like the fiberglass in your in your flex circuit. Now oh, you don't okay. have you don't have skew issues because there's no uh, there's no glass, so you don't have the micro decay effects. Now, if you do have a crosshatch plane, uh, you will have uh, a difference. Right. You know, different. You'll have a micro impedance effect, if you would. Um, but that usually doesn't change with differential pairs. You know, unless again, depending on where you put the, the traces. Um, but um, you don't have the fiberglass micro decay effect at all. Um, now. Kapton's interesting. It's very thermally stable, but it's not as mechanically strong as glass reinforced laminate. So it tends to um, change more for mechanical distortion than it does for thermal. It's not shrinking like epoxies do when they cure. Mm -hmm. um, certainly when you when you remove all the copper, and I actually have a piece here. This is okay. a piece of, of Pyrolex AP with all the copper etched off. This is 100% polyimide. Okay. Uh, used to have copper cladding on it, and the copper has been mostly etched off. You can see a little bit of copper left, you know, left from right. the uh, from the tape I used to run this through an etcher. Uh, but the material is pretty strong. But it but it does just it can distort mechanically uh, more so than thermally. Um, so again, this is kind of like the fiberglass in a in a regular PCB. And then you'd have B stages of some sort to put all the layers together. So um, the actual substrate is creating the stability right. in, in the case of flex. Okay, that makes sense. Right. It's a poly it's a polyimid film. In the case of in the case of Pyrolux, which is a, a DuPont branded flex material, um it's it's based on Kapton. It's based on Kapton film. Okay. So So um 
so, okay, we talked about ground planes. We talked about where to not put. Is there any other sort of design for flex um, things that you'd want to mention that are just rather commonplace? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things. Uh, for example, um, you could use a, a pad that's a little bit larger than you would normally use that would go underneath the coverlay. Now let me back up a little bit and talk about coverlay. So what coverlay is, is basically a capped on adhesive laminate that is the flexible equivalent of solder mask. Now unlike solder mask, which is used in PCB, which is um, photo imageable, uh, coverlay has to be mechanically uh, formed and then laminated over the circuitry. So you'd have openings, and this again, this is a, another good example, you have openings in the coverlay I don't know if you can see that on this, but there's openings on the cover lay for each individual pad, and then that's laminated over. Um, one of the one of the ways to get more reliability out of the pads is to make the uh, pad a little bit bigger than the opening in the cover lay. So you have cover lay over the perimeter of the pad. Right. It's kind of like what we call solder mask defined pad and rigid. Yes. Except you're except you're doing it in flex, and that's that's one way to get reliability. But there are, again, there there are a lot of different things in flex that you should uh, you should you know, be aware of, and that's where some of these design guides and, and things. Okay, we'll help. we'll try to track some of those down and put those in the show notes because I think that would be really helpful to have something kind of tangible. Um, something I remember learning from someone else is also talking about tear dropping pads. Yes, is yeah. that something sure. that you would recommend as well? Yeah, and uh, that's that's good for a couple of different reasons. One is that's more material that goes under the cover lay. Again, helps mechanically support the pad. It's also important, typically you don't put, put uh, holes or pads near a bend area, but right. that, could be, that could be an area where you could concentrate um, bending. So in other words, you go from a trace to a, to a pad, uh, that's going to become a uh, concentration of, right at the edge of the pad, uh, right. a concentration of, uh, of stress. And so if you do the teardrop, that distributes that stress over a larger area and helps prevent uh, you know circuit cracking okay uh, but again you would you would uh, you would try and avoid that you know that in your design right. yeah you wouldn't you would make that a bend area right and actually uh, speaking of uh, rigid flex one of the things that you, you would uh, you would typically do is you, the cover lay would go into the rigid portion only 50 mils okay okay and then you would keep the cover lay and its adhesive out of the play through hole areas in the rigid portion and rigid flex. Uh, and okay. that's also a keep out region for plated through holes. You wouldn't want plated through holes going through that region. So okay. again, all, a lot of this stuff is spelled out in some of the, some of the, uh, okay. uh manuals that, that you can right. get from DuPont and others. All right. I'll reach out to Jonathan and, and you and I can scrounge up some things and we'll make sure to include those here. Um, last thing I wanted to talk to you about, which I was just stunned by is, that you told me that DuPont has come out with a new material that has unbelievable thermal performance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so so classically in flex, you have your your B stage or adhesives that are uh, that are part of the package, and then you have your core materials, which are your building blocks. And you would print at your core just like rigid, and you would you would put them together with either your rigid or your your flex uh, adhesives uh, to make a, a multi layer system. Uh, what's different about this new product? It's called Pyrolux HT, and okay. uh, in fact, I got my Pyrolux uh, HT uh, mug here. Nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, but instead of using acrylic or epoxy adhesives to bond the Kapton layers together, uh, you would you use this thermoplastic polyamide layer. Now it's got a very high melting point. Mm -hmm. And thermoplastics are used in PCB. People yeah. people are familiar with uh, FEP and LC, uh, you know, liquid LCP, crystal polymers, right? right. Uh, those systems, um, the only, only way thermoplastics work in PCB or reflow assembled PCB is to have a high melting point. Otherwise, it would melt at assembly. So uh, this is a piece of the thermoplastic polyamide that DuPont manufactures. Okay. It's the HT bonding film. This could either be a cover lay or it could be a, um, an adhesive layer to put to make a multi-layer PCB. Okay. But the nice thing about this is, is uh, it's it has a uh, 225 Celsius operating temperature, which is very very high. Um, what does that convert yeah. to Fahrenheit? Oh gosh, um, 225 C. 
It's over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. RC, right? 220 Fahrenheit. Okay, I wasn't yeah. hearing you correctly. So, so, so it was Fahrenheit. Okay. Oh, no, wait, wait. hang on. 225. <laughs> nice. I should know this off the top of my head. 437 Fahrenheit. Wow. So, you know, some applications that And were... that's an operating, continuous operating yes. temperature, which is yeah. crazy because some materials can take that heat for a little while or, but not well, continuing operating temperature, right? Right. So, so most PCB materials that go through reflow assembly, which is either done at 260, mm -hmm. um, you know, Celsius, depending on the, on the type of solder or, or 288C, they can withstand that for a short period of time. Right. Most most PCB materials survive that. Um, it's um, it's the operating temperature. Most most epoxy systems are come in around 130 to 150 C operating temperature, maximum operating temperature. That's wild. So so the so is, is I'm guessing. So what are the applications where this will be exciting so, news? So uh, applications where you had. Uh, you know, fiberglass, uh, you know, coax or some other applications like that where you had, you know, wired, high temperature wired connections or cable connections, you could replace now with a printed circuit board. So uh, engine compartments, uh, aircraft engine compartments, uh, you know, aerospace, downhole. I mean, there are a lot of different applications. Even from a medical standpoint, you know, imagine making a flex circuit that could be autoclaved over and over and over again. You don't have to I worry was about gonna, I was going to ask you about that earlier i don't really know what temps they autoclave at but you mentioned that before that medical applications could to uh, could autoclave right to yeah, so, so kill the bacteria just, but like right. what's the normal temp of an autoclave and how many times can you do that so so uh we have one customer that builds some parts that are autoclaved at 135c okay. but it's you know it's it's with steam and uh, it's hard on circuits. It's hard on uh, electronics. Yeah, seems uh, like it would be. But for HT, it wouldn't be any issue um, because you're nowhere near the melting point. Now, it will absorb some moisture, uh, which could be removed from from uh, could be removed with a bake. Okay. But in a lot of applications, it won't matter if the assembly is already done. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, you know, there there is some change in the uh, in the uh, transmission properties of the material when it absorbs some moisture. But again, that can be removed with a bake. But, okay. Uh, but that is one of the challenges with, with reusable medical devices is sterilization and, right. and how well the materials hold up. And, and HT uh, would be good for that. The downside of HT is it does require 600-degree lamination, Fahrenheit. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. There's the – so that's, how many so board shots so have land presses that go up to that temp? So we, we took a look at our customer base, and uh -huh. it's, not a, it's not a lot of them. Uh, or some of our customers had lamin or have lamination presses that, uh, that are capable. They're rated that high, but they haven't been turned up that high for a long, long time. So it's funny. Some of our customers have started making some HT. All the weaker heaters, you know, that the, the press might be 10 years old, they turn it up for the first time at a higher <laughs> temperature. They start popping heaters, and they have to go and replace them. But actually, we're seeing a trend, though. A lot of our customers are buying laminating equipment. And right now, that's a whole other story because lead times are way out on, on equipment in oh. general. But um, what we're seeing is is people are, are making sure they have that high temperature capability. And it's it's not just for something like HT. It's for LCP and FEP as well you know, okay. for all film. Um, they have some good properties, uh, electrical and signal properties. They do. That's, they're that's a that's a big deal these days. Performance wise, they're very good. Right, uh, they're harder to fabricate, but uh, yeah, but they do have some good properties. So, you know, uh, even you know, we talked about last time, even P glass reinforced PTFE materials, some of them require high you know high lamination temperatures. Yeah, so, they do. Yeah, so. Well, oh, that, actually, one, more, uh, oh, one more material I do want ahead. to mention. Sorry. All right, let's see. So it. this material actually is a Teflon Kapton laminate. It's uh, called TK. Wait, hold on. Teflon Kapton. Oh, okay. So it's called TK. It's a Pyrolux product from Dupont, and so it has a um, it has a core of Kapton to act as the XY stabilizer, but then it has uh, a Teflon uh, material on both sides. And again, this is a building block, uh, but it's very low loss and very low decay. So decay of about two and a half uh, with a very, very low loss. Um, but unlike glass reinforced Teflon systems, this has no fiberglass, so no skew. 
and no detrimental effect from the uh, from the fiberglass. It's using the Kapton instead as the stabilizer. Because if you had a piece of, I, I should have brought out a piece of Teflon, but uh, PTFE films you can easily you yeah. know, mechanically, mechanically yeah. stretch. One time when I was in the RF and microwave board space, I had the board shop I was working for take all the materials, you know, like Rogers, Taconic, whatever, and I had them strip all the copper off. And I went, you know, like the 4,000 series, 6,000 series, 3,000 series, all the way up to 5880 and strip off the copper. Because when you see them clad, they don't look that different from each other. Right. But I'm like, here's Teflon. <laughs> it is yeah. like a piece of rubber. And imagine heating that up, exposing that to aqueous hot processes. And so I think that really helped people to understand, you know, how vastly yeah. different they are. And I think it was a good visual actually to help people understand how radically different these are, right? And when you start stripping off all the copper and you have fine lines and all that, then it's it's a whole different animal. Yeah, the TK material is, the core material is nice because the, the Kapton layer yeah. does provide mechanical strength. Again though, the TK, instead of requiring 600 degree lamination, it requires 550. So it's still a high temperature product. Okay. Which requires, you know, the the right press book, the right materials and lamination, and it also requires a, a press being capable. And the other thing too is the board shop needs to get uh, accustomed to the dimensional changes during the lamination process with these materials. Right. Again, a lot of it's mechanically driven, but you, you need to know how to work with it. Yeah. And, uh, so that's something that, that, you know, the board shop needs to have experience with. But Well, uh, and I imagine that you're not going to see these materials outside of sort of high performance or high speed capable board shops. Uh, that's, that's true. Um, I don't you know, know if seeing, that's true. I guess well, I'm looking to you for an answer on there, but I'm, it's an assumption I would make. Here's the interesting thing about AP. AP by itself is actually pretty good electrically. It's the adhesive layers you use that, that incur a lot of the loss. Uh -huh. um, so then if you get into the into the thermoplastic systems that have better electrical performance, now you're getting into the high temperature range. So it's you know it's one of those uh, give and take situations. Uh -huh. but, uh, but you can mix and match the materials to some degree. Um, you could use, for instance, HT bonding film with AP clads your operating temperature would default to the AP operating temperature, which is still pretty high at 180C. Um, but electrically, it's it's pretty good. You get away from the uh, the acrylic and the epoxy adhesives, which aren't great electrically, you know, in terms right. of loss loss yeah. of dielectric constant. So uh, yeah, I, I think as I think as board shops become better equipped with high temperature systems, you, you, you'll see a, a, a broader use of these materials. Right, yeah, I mean, the market is gonna drive us there one way or the other, right? If if it's a, if there's a demand, then the board shops will do what they need to do. Uh, one thing, a comment I wanna make about that is, um, uh, I, I was in one board shop and I was stunned and then just felt like, wow, I could have had a V8 moment is, they were providing really high speed, high performance circuits to, to some high end military stuff. And they had moved completely away from rigid high performance laminates and used multiple layers of flex materials and the performance. And I'm like, oh, well that seems like a, an obvious, but I had no idea that was even happening. Is that something you have seen where they just use? Yeah. If you wanted to get rid of skew completely, you could use a film based system. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, that makes sense. And I, I'm sure there's some challenges there because I could tell they had to rigidize the bottom or put some kind of carrier or something because they didn't want it to flex quite that much, but they just stacked these film systems on top of each other. And I'm like, huh. Didn't know you could I, yeah. do that, but it, they were clearly doing it on a routine basis. So I thought that was I, interesting. I've, yeah, I've seen some some uh, board designs where you might have, you know, 12 cores of, of yeah. Pyrolux, right? Yeah. And then use regular rigid prepreg as a bonding system. So, and the board's not, when it's all done, it's not flexible. It's it's rigid. It is rigid, but it's it's a weird, it's, it's yeah. weird to see. Anyways. I, but... actually, I actually have a board here. Okay, so, and, let's and see it's, it. it. Unfortunately, it's single-sided, so it's it's kind of like a potato chip. 
but because uh, there's only one layer of copper and only right. one layer of prepreg. But this is actually Dupont's AP product uh -huh. with uh, Isola's tachyon prepreg, and it's a spread glass prepreg. So you have the spread glass prepreg on one side, and you've got the uh, Pyrolux AP in the other. So you minimize how much glass is in here, which uh, really uh, you know drops the uh, amount of uh, impact or micro decay effect, which would lead to skew and other signal performance uh, issues. Hmm. So there are lots of different ways you could use yeah. uh, the flex materials, even uh -huh. in a rigid in a rigid design. Yeah, I uh, I I I did see that, and I was shocked, and and I it's something I hadn't heard a lot about. Anyways, well, we're about out of time today again, okay. and um, but thank you so much. Every time I talk to you, I feel like I learn so so much and it's fascinating to me where the industry is going and 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 what's happening with flex and it's exciting it's really an enabler right and these high high temp products and that so it's a really exciting time to see you know we always break through one way or another it's just interesting to see who gets it done so it's very interesting to see what we're doing with flex oh thank thank you judy for you know giving us the opportunity to talk about some of the materials we supply uh, but yeah, it's uh, these are all building blocks, and you know, I mean, I I kind of view us as a material, you know, material science company. In fact, you, you are, know, that, yeah. That we we provide all these different building blocks to to you know meet the need of what what the customer needs. And, what and there the, is, uh, and there's really uh, unique ways to put those building blocks together. So it's fascinating to learn about. Okay, so something I didn't ask you last time, but I'm going to ask you now: Are you a geek or a nerd? <laughs> so, so the best the best way I heard uh, the two described is the difference between a geek and a nerd is a geek is the one who gets things done. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so I I would like to think I'm somebody who gets stuff done. So, uh, you know, that would put me in the geek camp. But okay. Uh, in any case. All right. Uh, check. <laughs> geek. All right, geek. Okay. And the second question I have for you on a scale from one to ten. How weird are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I would I would say five. I mean, that's you know. That's a uh, safe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but if we're in this industry, we're at least five or above. I think you know. Maybe we have to be a little wacky to, <laughs> to do what Maybe. we do. Okay, well, thanks. I appreciate it so much. And Welcome. again, you know, we were talking on the phone yesterday. We have more to cover, so I'm gonna for sure have you back again and talk about printed electronics which is on the rise and you know a lot about and also i'm very excited to talk about oh there it is printed electronics yeah there's that's a whole other whole other world of electronics and uh yeah wait wait also, wait bring that back and tell our listeners <laughs> what exactly that is so this was printed with a zebra label printer um where the uh and no changes to the machine by the way but the uh, a special foil is put into the uh, uh, system where you would normally put a uh, a roller with uh, with a pigment film. So instead of printing a black label, you're printing metal foil. So uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And what? Yes, what is that for? Uh, well, this this is something did did for me uh, at our at our booth. Uh, this is just an antenna. Um, but you could really you could make make electronic designs on the fly now the dude downside, you're still not answering my question here <laughs> what is that antenna for so I'm going to use that for an antique stereo I have I have an antique uh, FM stereo um, a tube old tube radio I'm going to use that as an antenna uh, see oh, see definitely five weird <laughs> I see I'm gonna make I'm gonna make that matrix instead of the hot crazy matrix I'm gonna make like the geeky weird matrix and so yeah you you're you're at least at a five high <laughs> and a geek <laughs> but anyway printed electronics is pretty exciting i mean uh and again it's it's all material science based as the materials get better you're going to be able to do more things um uh, higher conductivity uh inks uh higher temperature inks i mean there's there's all kinds of things you can do in that area uh typically the substrates are different uh they're typically lower cost uh Lower temperature capable substrates, uh, but you could you can make all kinds of things. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that next time. Okay, <laughs> we'll definitely do that. And the other thing I'm excited to talk to you about because I know nothing about it um, is paste interconnects. And you shared a little bit. So 
anyways, we have at least one or two more podcasts ahead of us. So um, for our listeners, stay tuned and we'll make sure and share everything Chris has talked about today and hook you up with resources through DuPont, HD Pug, IPC, wherever we can find them. We'll make sure and share those resources that will help you lay out a better flex and, and onboard as much information as you can. So, Chris, thanks again. We'll see you next well, time and we'll, you know, tackle another hot topic. Okay. Um, again, this has been Judy Warner with the On Track Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and thank you to Chris Hunrath from InSelectro. We will see you next time. Until then, always stay on track. Oh.